exclusive interview <laughs> with um, Stetson Wilshire, aka um, RPB, Plastic Bag. Uh, let's start by asking you how you got that name, the uh, performing name, Plastic Bag. Well, when I was preparing for my first competition back in 1979, in St. Philip, first of all, I got involved sim simply out of uh, this group not having enough people to be in the competition, and I decided that I'll, I'll make up a number. Uh, we had four people who wanted at least five, and I decided to get involved. And um, I had no stage name, and all the others had stage names. I went to the beach one Sunday, about two weeks before the actual competition. And I uh, came back all burnt in the sun, and a nephew looked at me, he said, you, you look like a red plastic bag. So to me, that was funny, very funny, I laughed, and I said, you know what, maybe that's the name I should go with. So I decided I'll call myself Red Plastic Bag, and uh, I'm glad I did that, because um, it seems so insignificant. And um, in that time, they had Lord, this body, mighty, the next person, king, the next, and uh, to be called Red Plastic Bag, it was kind of different, and there was a color to, to work with, uh, they had something to wave. So I, I actually loved uh, the name then, and as much as I love it now. Great. Um, incidentally, I'm wearing something close to right today, and uh, you're not, so that's why I put on this shirt. I forget we were right today. <laughs> <laughs> but in any event, uh, you, you prefer the acronym RPB or Red Plastic Bag, or does it make a difference? Well, it doesn't really make a difference. I think most people who call me RPB now um, is, is shorter. and. Oh. Um, uh, it seems more affectionate. Yeah. Uh, so, but it doesn't matter. Uh, people call me all sorts of things. They call me plastic. They call me a red. They call me a bag. Uh, so it's cool. Right. Yeah. Well, I was, um, I guess you can say, uh, fortunate to work with you about uh, numerous things in New York and in the festival band. And the one the question I had for you, analyzing at the time, was when you write a song, do you write it? with a hit in mind or you just write and hoping that it would become a hit or you write uh, with uh, potential hits in mind? Well, when I write a song, I try, all, all the songs that I do, I try to write them to, to the best of my ability. I believe that if you're going to be putting something out, you need to, to do it to the best of your ability. Um, the unfortunate thing about festivals, uh, for us Calypsonians, we, we compose songs primarily for the crop of a festival or whatever festival it is you're involved um, in. And uh, you, you tend to um, be boxed in to a great extent. If you're going to be in competition, you tend to want to think about a song that may be good in competition based on what is expected in a competition. Or write a sort of party song based on what uh, people are responding to in, um, you know, for that particular, uh, particular period. Um, but uh, I've grown out of that now to the point where I'm composing songs um, just to the best of my ability, yeah, composing the song, not thinking um, so much about the festival or competition. I just want to do the song to the best of my ability and I, I, I know compose my music and with the world in mind and uh, just making a good song. Yeah, because from analyzing the, you know, your songs, they always seem to deal with their reality. Yeah. In the uh, simplest form. Yes, that's right. So I'm trying, I was trying to wonder when you sit down and write, if it's like, well, you know, this is a tear, and this tear can be looked at in 10 different ways, and I'm going to write something about it in the simplest form to let people see that a tear can be for sitting, standing on, you know, rolling over and falling them off of, you know. Mm -hmm. When you write, is it for the masses, or I'm going to write this particular song to be sending a message to a higher level rather than from that anybody can relate to it. Yeah. I might write a song, I, I write a song thinking that I I want anybody at any level to be able to be able to understand what I'm saying. Of course my um, topics very often are uh, they're born out of what I feel comes as a society. I, my ears are very close to the ground. I am cognizant of what's happening around me. So most of my songs come out of what I feel from happening around me and the things I hear coming from people and the, the kind of things I hear on the street. So when I compose a song, I, I, I tend not to, although the message has to reach people at the highest level, I, I must still um, make sure that the man on the street understands what I'm saying and feel confident in the fact that I'm representing him, especially 
that person who's considered to be in the low socioeconomic bracket, that person who doesn't get a chance to, to go on stage and say, well, to, to express themselves. So when I go there with a song, um, either um, on, on a CD or, or, or live, it is all about doing that song in a way that the average person on the street can understand. So what's it like to be, quote unquote, under constant pressure to deliver every time by going on stage, especially when it's new competition, you know, you look in the stands and you see your, your bags, you know, waving if it still happens. I haven't seen it since I'm 87. That's, that's, mm -hmm. that's my early festival, right? Yeah. And when I see that at the stadium, I'm going to like, wow, this is like, you know, um, the, the energy booster uh, to perform. Yeah. Like in the stand, you see those mm. reds moving. So, how is it like to be under that pressure constantly? It's a lot of pressure. Yeah. It's a, lot, a whole lot of pressure. As a matter of fact, I, I've always said to people that, um, you know, I started off with here on my head and um, the pressure of, of expectation, the, the pressure to deliver, um, you know, has really taken its toll on me as it relates to the competition especially. I believe that um, music has to be free also. I, I think that competitions in Calypso may be good for the festival. But I don't think that competitions are really good for the music. I think that they, you tend to be railroaded down in a particular, di particular direction. So you need to set yourself free of, of these things um, like competition. They're good for festival, but as it relates to uh, being able to develop and be creative and, and to just make music. Um, they, they may not be the best things, but yes, tremendous pressure for competition because people want you to win or your fans want you to win, so you feel that pressure coming through. Whereas on the other hand, um, it, would only, it would only be about making a good song for the people. Uh, for incorporate but investors generally, for Calypsonians, it is the pressure of people wanting to feel within themselves that their, 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 their horse, as they call it, uh, is in a position to, to win. Yeah. I don't want to sound redundant, but how and where do you write? You have a special well, place that you... Well, I used you know. to, I, I, I write anywhere, but I, I used to do a lot of writing up White Haven, I like quiet places. Um, but these days I write a lot in hotel rooms and, and, um, and on aircraft. Uh, when I, I have long haul flights, um, anything over four hours or so, I, uh, eight hours, 12 hours, I sit and I, I use a lot of time to use that time in, in a quiet moments to write and, and to reflect. Yeah, okay, is, uh, I don't wanna, well, I guess I could ask, um, how, did, how do you see plastic bag? Let's say you just celebrating an anniversary. Yeah, thirty years. Yeah, for thirty years. Uh, how do you see Pass back another twenty years or from now? So well, that's, I, I, still doing I, what he loves doing, or? Yeah. Well, I, yes, I would want to. I would want to still be involved in Calypso. I love the art form with all my heart. I love music. Um, I would still want to be able to be around it, not necessarily in competition, but to be able to to work with young people. I love to work with young people. I like, would like to continue because um, I still do a lot of that working around schools, uh, working with people in ter terms of looking at the creative process uh, and, and trying to get more younger, young people involved in the art form. And uh, I would want to be involved primarily at that level. Uh, you know, as I grow older, I don't mind being on stage, but I, it's not every day that I'm going to want to be running up and down on the aircraft, going here and there. I would want to. To, um, to seek some seek satisfaction from other areas in terms of being able to give something back. Yeah, do you think at any time as a writer you would ever be stuck for something to write ideas? Well, there, there are always things, uh, there are always, always uh, many things out there to, to, to write about. Um, I've always said to people, you shouldn't have to wait until something happens to be able to write if you're, if you're a composer. I mean, you could write a song about a cloud. Um, and I've always said to people, um, the beautiful songs of, of, of variable things that you know you never think that people want to write songs about, and, and the, the power of a song, um, the effectiveness of a song, may not necessarily be seen um, to you, the person who composed it, or even people around you. But music has a way of moving. You may never know how a line or a stanza in a song that you sing could have a positive impact or even a negative impact. 
on, um, on some person millions of miles away. Uh, so you have to consider the fact that when you, this is why it's so important that you're writing a song, you do to the best of your ability and um, make sure that, you know, you remember that the world is listening. Right. Okay, do you consider yourself a prolific writer? If and when did you know that you were? I, I, I've written a lot of songs in my time. Um, I, to, to use the word um, prolific, um, if, if I'm composing uh, eight to ten songs a, a year, uh, if you consider that prolific, if composing uh, nearly 400 songs in 30 years, uh, if that's prolific, well then maybe I am, but uh, I still believe I can write a lot more. I still believe that, that um, uh, in the past five years or so, I actually, um, I, I actually compose less than I, I composed in my early, early days, but I still believe that I have a lot more in me in terms of composing, and um, I want to continue to compose. Right, but without being modest, do you think you are? Uh, I think I've written a lot of songs in my time. Yeah, because you know, um, if you don't give yourself props, yeah, then yeah. yeah, but a lot, yeah, lots of people don't know that I, um, lots of people don't know that I've actually composed songs that won Caribbean Song Contest. I compose songs that um, that for other Calypsonians outside of the region, I've had the, the privilege to oh. compose for people like Arrow, Swallow, yeah. uh, and um, I, I, I love to write. I love, love to compose. I must give special credit to a man by the name of William Arthur, who, um, who he died last year at 102. Um, he taught me uh, poetry and taught me how to, to break it all down and, 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 and use the language to, in, you know, uh, to my advantage, being able to exploit the English language, uh, you know, exploiting all the literary devices and so on. He was able to help me to, to, to look at, at words from several different angles and, and the way they're said and where they are placed, uh, the different things that it can mean and so on. So he actually broadened my view on language and uh, I want to say a special thanks to him, William Arthur from Arthur C. St. Thomas. Right, well, interesting. Yeah. Um, as far as influences go, both locally and internationally, uh, who would you uh, put on your list? Well, I, I've always had great respect um, for, for Mighty Gabby and what he has done from around here. Um, there's several other um, Calypsonians uh, from around here and, and artists from around here generally. Uh, but as a Calypsonian, Gabby has always been um, Gabby. Gabby's presence was always was instrumental in in, um, in being a driving force for me. I'm um, always something to to to, um, to aim at or, or to 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 emulate. Uh, he. He, um, he's an excellent artist and uh, one I've admired over the years. As a Calypsonian outside of this region, I, I have great love and respect for, for the Mighty Chalkness. I think that he is um, a Calypsonian of the, of the highest caliber. I don't think you, you, you get much better than that. And um, I, I love music generally and several artists across the world. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I, I love two of my favorite artists. Um, uh, out there, uh, Neil Diamond. I mean, I, I've been a, a, a big um, Neil Diamond uh, fan for for years. I I, I, I love Celine Dion. Uh, I'm a Rihanna fan also. Right. I love Anita Baker. Right. You know, so I mean, there, there are several people um, out, out there that um, that I, I I love as as artists and uh, and I've followed for for many years. So since you called some. Pretty good uh, balladeers, in my, in my opinion. Um, have you ever considered doing like an album of ballads, or what you would call a crossover album? Uh, but yeah, well, it, it's something that I, I consider a few songs that I've done over the years are already outside of the genre of calypso. Um, songs like Brothers Keeper and and a song called You and You, one called Excellence in Life, and uh, there's a. Uh, another one that I, I don't quite remember the, the name right now, but there are quite a few that were actually outside of the, um, the genre of, of Calypso. And, um, and, you know, because I'm so, because most of my music is done within the, the confines of a crop overseas, and most of my music tends, tend to to be down the road of, of Calypso, and so but this is why I have not been driven as much um, in that direction. But I've, I, I've actually composed um, songs for the Caribbean Song Contest and other songs that were done by artists around Barbados that were actually 
and I'll not clip through at all. I, I actually give great consideration to to um, to to broadening, um, you know, my my um, my stuff as far as creativity is concerned. Right, which leads me to CDs. If you release a CD, uh, sometimes the placement of a song determines the hit. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the first song is the song that you want to attract and people. Sometimes the the song that you think won't be the hit could be the last track, could be the middle track. Mm -hmm. So have you been surprised over the years that saying, well, this is the one that I'm actually pushing, but then you get to realize that track number four is what people request most of all or get the most airplay. Do that happen pretty uh, often that the songs that you write, like oh, for instance, Once Upon a Wine, mm -hmm. it's obvious that it has a nice hook and a nice uh, rhythm. Mm -hmm. But there might be something on the album that you deemed the hit mm -hmm. rather than Once Upon a Wine, but then mm -hmm. you realize that's a big um, surprise to me. I wonder why people like that. Does that happen pretty often, or is it a case where you just know well track two is going to be the song that is going to be the potential hit? Yeah, there's some songs that there's some songs that you, you you produce and you can tell based on the response that you may be getting from people who enter the studio, people who, who hear um, the the song. You can tell that it is resonating well with them. And um, there's a possibility that the song can go beyond. But very often, you have songs on the album that that um, that take off in a way that you you, you didn't really expect. For argument's sake, I knew that Raga Raga would have been um, would have received attention, but I never thought that Raga Raga would have gone to the level that it has actually gone. So um, I mean, and the level of time, the amount of time we took to record Raga Raga, um, it, it, it was the time that we took to mix it and so on. We didn't. We didn't really spend the greatest amount of time um, on, on, on that song. I mean, we tried our best to do it to the best of our ability, but that was one of the songs that was done quite quickly, and, we, and a song that to us was not the main focus of what um, of, of the album. We had other songs that, that were um, seen as a different level, and Aragorago became my most popular song ever. Yeah. So um, production-wise, it was like, ah, let's do this. Uh people might probably like it but you like you said you didn't expect it would be in internationally um popular mm -hmm. that i think i heard you say that the performance i was saying in a different uh, language or a couple of different yeah it's, it's recorded in seven different languages um you know has been a theme song about a lot of region i know it was played in the nba finals 1996 mm -hmm. is in a movie called the sparrow's nest um it, it um there's a dance in colombia called the called the um, the Raga Raga dance, there was a cruise in Bermuda called the Raga Raga cruise, also in Cuba is popular, mm -hmm. has been number one to, um, in, in many African countries. Uh, it, it's, it's a song that, that um, is a song that, that has done great things for me, it's on a, a Sony compilation with the likes of Celine Dion. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for me, uh, I would have never thought that, um, that, you know, I would have had a song to, to have gone that far, but now that I recognize that the world is really on regular steps with the with um, with the internet and and um, social and, and media, if you social will. media, yeah. um, you know, we make music for the world, and and nothing of that sort is beyond us uh, when we make music. When we make music, the world hears it. Right. So what's next for Plastic Bag? Um. Uh. What next for me is to continue to uh, to do the, the sh my shows or, or that I do around the USA and. and in the, in the Caribbean, um, but I, I, I really need to um, look at the fact that I've had 30 years now, people have had 30 years of me, and uh, I need to start thinking about how I'm going to repackage myself in, and, and, and um, you know, just to, to stay relevant. I, I've spent many um, long nights thinking uh, about um, the music, what I present to people. Uh, I, I, I need to remain uh, fresh enough to be to be for my music to be accepted. The reality is that you really can't stock your shelf with something that people are not buying. You need to remain um, current, and um, I, I need to continue to focus on what is happening in the marketplace. If I don't do that, I, I can just fall to the cracks, um, and I really don't want to do that. I still believe I have uh, quite a few years left in in terms of um, what I can create. So I will continue to create. And um, as I said earlier, 
I want to spend a lot more time with young people in terms of working uh, on, the, on the development of, um, of Calypso and soccer music with young people. Right, well, I was going to lead to that next question. Any advice for the younger folks coming up now as far as saying, well, I want to be a writer, I want to be a performer, I want to be a singer. Um, what advice would you uh, give? Well, them? advice I would give to anybody who wants to get involved in anything. Anytime you're going to do anything that you love and you want to make a career out of it, you have to do it with all your heart. You have to have, first of all, have respect for yourself, have respect for what you're going into. Learn as much as you possibly can about it. Uh, and uh, go into it with all your heart. Focus on it. Remain focused. Uh, especially if you're going to be going into music, make sure that you understand what is happening out there. Uh, make sure you register your works with, with uh, whatever organizations out there that are supposed to help you to protect it, to make sure that you, you get what is due to you. Uh, an organization like COSCA, uh, maybe um, BMI, uh, ASCAP, PRS, whoever, if you're going to be a writer, a composer, or whatever, make sure that you get your work registered, registered. Make sure you use the avenues that are available to you to get your music out to the world. But you have to be focused. And this thing about trying a thing, um, you, you know, you know there's several positions or there, um, um, careers or there. You don't hear people, a lawyer or a doctor, going to say they're trying a thing. Why should you want to try a thing in music? Why should you want to try a thing as, 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 a, as a singer? It's a, it's a, it's, it's a big and serious um, uh, market that you're getting into. Music is, is one of the biggest money earners, if not the biggest money earner in the world. Why would you want to go into to the music market and say that you're trying to think? Do your thing to the best of your ability, don't just try it. Right. Yeah, that's some good advice, good yeah. sound advice. So I want to thank you for your time, and obviously the fans would see another side of RPB that they've probably never seen before, or can they say. Um, sometimes you see people on stage performing, but you wonder what is really like. I mean, you know, they like you from the perspective on stage, but they don't know if you got a soft side, a gruff side. So I guess from this interview, you can determine uh, what they are probably thinking, and they're probably right that you got a soft side. Well, yeah, well, I think I, I, I think that um, my my um, my life in general, I came from a very humble beginning, and, and I love people. I I don't know the hate. I have always loved people. I, I think that I'm quite easy to, to, to get along with and I believe that the world can be a better place if we can show more love for each other. Exactly. Thanks again. Thanks. Uh, I hope this one will be the last. I hope uh, not. Yeah, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you.